very few of us would have thought that within five years there would be a coordination of pol Arctic policies among the three Arctic states. So my first question uh, to the representatives uh, of uh, the current chair of the Arctic Council and the upcoming chair of the Arctic Council, what are your reflections on uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, coordination taking place? I, I'm not saying it's bad at all. Don't misunderstand my question. I want you to reflect on this. And then I would invite uh, the representatives of uh, Poland and the European Union uh, to uh, also share with us their short reflections on how this uh, might perhaps change how the European countries will react, uh, the observer states, with respect to the Arctic Council. So one of the advantages of having Finland in the chair is that you will be the first to answer that question. Hi, thank you. Um, I think that uh, as far as the coordination is, is concerned, uh, the Finns are pretty practical in, in, in their uh, orientation. And I think that, uh, that what we want to do is that to proceed the things in an orderly manner, little by little, making small steps. And uh, coordination, that's, as a small country, that's what we are used to. That, you know, the, you coordinate, you, you handle the, the problems with other countries with respect uh, and with inter, in, integrity. So I, as far as I know, now I think that my, my Arctic uh, ambassadors, they know it much better than I as a bilateral ambassador. But as far as I know, uh, I think that coordination has worked quite well. But not to say that there should be much more, uh, I would say, much more... Um, uh, intensity and as I uh, know that you know there is so much knowledge and so much uh, I would say competence uh, with uh, with uh, our observer countries that I feel that this is something that the trend should be increasing. Yes, thank you, President Grimson, for this uh, very challenging question. Uh, for Iceland, uh, it is uh, a primary uh, uh, primary uh, issue that the uh, Arctic Council remains the uh, sort of uh, main uh, venue for for uh, Arctic uh, governance. Uh, of course, uh, uh, how uh, observers prepare for engaging uh, at the level of the Arctic Council is up to the observers and we simply welcome uh, active participation uh, from, all, uh, from all the observers. Uh, we see observer engagement as uh, uh, a very important job on taking on the uh, chairmanship of the, of the Council. Uh, a lot of the responsibility lies with the chairmanship for uh, for uh, engagement uh, with the with the observers, uh, and we uh, see that we have what I call like a toolbox of different methods of engaging uh, with the observers, and uh, I can just tell you here that uh, we are very much committed to a strong engagement with the observers. We want to enhance it as much as possible in uh, line with both established practices, and if you have some new and innovative ideas on how to how to go uh, about with it. Uh, the main thing with the Arctic is that, uh, as has been said, bef said before, it is not so that what happens in the Arctic stays in the Arctic, and uh, what is happening in the Ar Arctic is a sort of a reflection of what is happening elsewhere in the world. So we need this broad engagement, and we want to strive to work on uh, on an Arctic Council that can deal with those uh, challenges. Thank you. Thank you. And before I give the word uh, to the representative of Poland, uh, please, if you have questions from the audience, uh, then raise your hand. You can do that immediately after anybody speaks. Uh, and I will notice that and decide whether to give you the opportunity to speak. So this is not just a dialogue among the panelists, but also for those of you in the audience who want to pose questions. Yeah. I take 
with great optimism and uh, satisfaction both what he's been ca currently doing uh, during the Finnish chairmanship and the number of ways to include observers at the level which I highlighted, not scientific, but uh, the semi-political, political, whatever we call it. And also with the great interest, I take the note of the declarations of the incoming chairmanship. Um, because in a way, I think it's in inevitable, uh, like also Ambassador Conings highlighted, this third phase of the Arctic policy that it's getting more and more multilateral and we somehow taking advantage of the goodwill of cooperation uh, is to take advantage of the observers. Um, and in this respect, I think that um, um, obviously uh, it doesn't change the, the, the membership of the Arctic Council as such. There are formal structures which we do respect, but I like, uh, like I already um, referred to uh, Ambassador Yamamoto. Um, I mean, not, not native speaker, but I see the difference between observer and the partner, the, the observance and the partnership. That partnership does not include the membership, but it's, I think, a bit more active in a manner um, to, uh, to engage in a, a collaboration with the problems which, uh, even though not being Arctic state, have consequences either caused by us or might have consequences for, for us in the future in order to support those that live there and operate um, in this uh, particular region. So the, if, I, if I can see with the very lots of optimism the potential direction this, this discussion, collaborations, involvement may go, this, let's say, partnership approach appeal uh, very much uh, uh, to, a to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, uh, I fully subscribe what my Polish colleague uh, just said. Now, we are maybe, as European Union, a special case. Uh, I'm not referring to our status at, uh, as observer in, in, in the Arctic Council, uh, but uh, the policy of the European Union on the Arctic is uh, approved by our member states, by our European Parliament. So it's, it's a policy which applies to, I would say, to all our 28 uh, member states. And uh, so we don't really coordinate on that. Uh, but uh, what we are doing, and uh, I have particularly have been uh, pushing that, it's, it's two things, is to have within the bodies of the European Union discussions on the Arctic, which never actually uh, happened. Uh, and also, um, I would say, being very active in engaging with third parties. So I'm very proud to say that I have uh, done official visits to uh, Japan, to China, and, and now to, to uh, Korea, which, which is its, its, its part, and uh, whereby I would say then we also have this kind of consultations. On the uh, Arctic uh, Council, uh, the Arctic Council is a major body, I would say, but it's not the only one. There are also others, and I think that it's in our interest also to be active uh, in the other arenas which are very important. Within the Arctic Council, it's also not only the number of observers that, that count, uh, it's uh, the, the fact that, and it's not only, for example, the work, what observers are doing in the working groups. We have here a, a colleague of ours, uh, Elisabetta, who spoke here yesterday. She's active in, in one of the uh, working groups of the Arctic Council. But it's, and uh, I very much welcome um, the, uh, what the Finnish presidency already has done. Uh, but uh, we're also looking forward very much of Iceland's uh, chairmanship because involvement is, as uh, Piotr said, it's, it's partnership and, as, and it's having also a real dialogue, uh, I would say, that we would appreciate having uh, with uh, the, the members of the Arctic Council. A dialogue and being uh, involved and looking forward very much to the innovative uh, mechanism that Iceland will uh, come forward with. Well, let me um, turn the question to uh, the representatives of the three Asian uh, countries. Uh, after having uh, witnessed uh, the uh, increasingly active role of Korea, China, and Japan in the Arctic, I, I have started in my discussions with others to call you not observer states, but action states uh, in the Arctic. I know it's a new diplomatic term, uh, but... Uh, Given what you're doing in, in research, uh, which I think for each of your countries surpasses what some of the Arctic states are actually doing, 
and your engagement in the evolution of the Northern Shield, for, for example. These are just two concrete examples of uh, your action in recent years. But my question is, do you foresee that the evolution of your tripartite consultation, and I noticed what the Korean representative said about enhancing that structure, that you would gradually come forward with some joint policies with re from your three countries with respect to the Arctic states or other observer states uh, in the Arctic. I know you can't give a definite answer to that, but I'm asking you to reflect whether you see this tripartite consultation evolve in such a way that there would be a, a kind of a joint Asian viewpoint, whether it's on the science or the uh, northern sea routes or some other aspect. Who, who wants to start? Gao Feng. <laughs> okay. Yes, back. Please. Thank you, President. Uh, so uh, basically, the Korea the have actively participated in all kinds of activity the, uh, within the uh, allowance of Arctic Council. Uh, I remember the Korea participated in various kinds of meetings uh, around the 30, the 30 times annually. And also, uh, as I explained in the morning, the Korea uh, conducted various kinds of uh, research activity in the region. Uh, so, um, so we will continue our policy uh, in the future. So as I mentioned, we would like to uh, the build one more the shipping the research vessel the, to conduct the more ambitious the scientific the research in the Arctic and Antarctic as well. Uh, so the uh, I see quite uh, optimistic the view on the leadership of Arctic Council, the especially uh, the finishing the chairman uh, of Finland and also incoming the chairmanship of uh, Iceland. Uh, especially, the, I heard that the very positive implication uh, from the, the, at the last uh, the Arctic Council meeting, at the time, uh, the incoming chairman uh, imply they would like to consider the more engagement from the observer state. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the question uh, to, to us is uh, whether in the future uh, the Asian countries will uh, develop a kind of a joint uh, Arctic policy. Uh, I, I, I don't... Not, not perhaps a comprehensive policy, but a position on certain Arctic Okay, issues. yeah, yeah. Uh, I think... <laughs> uh, Probably not uh, in the form of uh, official uh, s steps and a, a kind of a joint document. I don't think that, uh, at least in the near future, I don't see that. But uh, as uh, the people know that uh, we have already the trilateral meetings in three years already. Uh, so the the circle has already uh, meet uh, both ends already met in Shanghai uh, this June, and we start an, another new cycle uh, uh, next year in uh, in uh, back in uh, Korea again, uh, and we uh, we have uh, these uh, joint statement uh, after each of the uh, trilateral meetings, and uh, we uh, people can see it on the, on the website. Uh, and uh, we started uh, already, as we said, uh, this morning, no, yesterday, I think. Uh, we uh, started already, uh, the scientists already uh, started to sit down together to see um, uh, whether we can uh, jointly develop some uh, scientific uh, programs. And this morning we heard also the, the uh, I think, very... Uh, interesting uh, useful uh, suggestion from uh, 
the direct director general of uh, of K KMI. Uh, yeah, that's uh, very interesting. Uh, I, I think uh, 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 progress could uh, well be made there. And uh, in uh, terms of uh, the Northern Sea Route or the Polar Silk Road, uh, we uh, also joined our hands uh, already very closely. For instance, a very interesting thing that uh, in July, uh, uh, the huge uh, vessel came to China with, uh, with a full load of uh, LNG from Yamal, and the first uh, uh, vessel arrived in Jiangsu province, uh, made, in, uh, made by Japan, uh, made by uh, uh, Korea, and owned by China and Japan. <laughs> so <laughs> economically, we also uh, all- well, That's uh, very interesting. I, uh, I thought I knew a lot about Arctic affairs, but that last point I hadn't uh, grasped. This uh, cooperation of the yes. LNG to uh, transport, yes. So the vessel is jointly owned by China and, and Japan? Or? Yes, uh, in uh, Yamal, uh, we yeah. all, these countries all played uh, 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 important roles, yeah. also in Yamal. So yeah. uh, you, you can see it's already kind of uh, um, actions, mm. joint actions. Mm. So the only thing that maybe, maybe people can, can see more, can, can wait is uh, uh, maybe were joint, uh, were deeper, uh, were longer joint statement of the, the trilateral meeting, speaking more mm. of our uh, uh, political will to uh, work together on more things. Mm. Okay, I, I think uh, currently that is a good uh, good uh, vehicle for us to express our uh, uh, joint uh, uh, will together. That's it. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, I think uh, regarding our trilateral corporations, uh, Ambassador Gao already mentioned a lot, so I have little to add uh, to what he said. Uh, but in general, uh, our three countries in this region really have very close coordination on many, many issues, not only the Arctic affairs, but also like an uh, environmental issue or a health issue or as a whole. So we have uh, quite uh, many uh, uh, China, Korea, Japan forums. Uh, so within that context, I think uh, we will continue to develop our uh, good coordination. And uh, of course, a uh, business is uh, maybe a little bit different sometimes uh, we have a joint uh, kind of operation, as uh, uh, Ambassador Gao said, the in Yamal project. It happened that the Japanese, Chinese, and the Korean companies are really working together. Uh, but uh, that's a ca case by case, because uh, business is uh, very much independent. So um, that being said, uh, the about sort of the, our sort of approach to Arctic Council as, as observers. Of course, I cannot speak for, for Korea, I cannot speak for China, uh, but uh, uh, my thoughts uh, were already expressed and then as uh, kindly supported by our colleague from Poland and then EU, I feel that the, uh, we have no intention to change our position as observers. Uh, remains to be as observer, uh, but we are very much willing to play more active role uh, as de facto partner. Uh, and then in that sense, uh, I, I have been very much working very closely with the current chair, uh, Finland chair, and then I really appreciate for, for his uh, really leadership. And then I'm very much looking forward to working closely with a uh, new incoming chair uh, so that we can have more good coordination. And then I have just one very, maybe my colleague may be embarrassed if I say this, but this is quite uh, my personal view. But uh, for, for your example, um, there's a one idea of having a good partnership among three with Arctic Council. Because uh, in this area, Asia, for example, there is a one strong uh, 
governing body, regional body, called the ASEAN. So ASEAN, Southeast Asia, 10 countries, really work together on many, many issues. And then they have uh, their own rule of engagement and then decision making. And then we are, Korea, Japan, China, are not member of ASEAN, but uh, we are partners of ASEAN. And then we have a periodical meeting, three of us and ASEAN on many issues. So my personal idea is that under the leadership of uh, Iceland, for example, during for three years, I think it would be great if uh, uh, some sort of a special session would be convened uh, between Arctic Council and three countries, for example, so that we can have more sort of a, you know, active discussion. This is just, just you know, one example, just for your consideration. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I think these have been uh, fascinating uh, reflections and uh, ideas. Uh, yes. So, yeah, sure. I uh, add uh, uh, one important uh, point. Uh, I think uh, after uh, Ambassador Yamamoto, I, I think it is interesting to note that uh, uh, we, uh, if we look at the uh, fisheries agreement on the, on the central uh, uh, Arctic uh, Ocean, it is interesting that the five uh, fishing states yeah. invited by the uh, United States uh, government yeah were all presented, uh, presented here. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, that's a new way of, uh, 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 I think, in a, a, more, a new uh, mode, maybe, yeah. in uh, governance of uh, the, Arctic, uh, uh, the Arctic affairs. Yeah, um, but I don't, uh, yeah Ambassador uh, David uh, Bolton is, is here. Uh, yesterday, I discussed this with uh, him also. So it's... Uh, now, it's, it, it shows that uh, the problems now are broader than already, than Arctic Council and Ar even the Arctic Economic Council. It's broadened already. Uh, so uh, that's um, the, the thing that uh, we found a new, uh, under the, under the um, uh, leadership of the United States, we found a new way, a new mode in, uh, the, uh, in the governance of, uh, of the Arctic. So that's the one thing that I would like to add to this discussion. So, uh, in that, uh, in that, uh, uh, under, under that uh, mode, so not only uh, uh, China, Korea, and, and Japan are pa uh, parties uh, with, uh, with these uh, uh, negotiations, but also uh, European Union. And uh, in that sense, uh, Iceland uh, is also, uh, was also um, uh, invited uh, uh, and joined party uh, parties to this uh, uh, new mode of uh, governance. Thank you. No, thank you very much. I think that was a very fascinating addition. And uh, this discussion illustrates what I've sometimes observed uh, more as a former professor of political science, that somehow the Arctic uh, cooperation has become a very innovative laboratory of uh, international cooperation. and. And uh, David Bolton also outlined these different aspects, uh, uh, some of them made by the Arctic Council, some of them, uh, some of them made separately. And what you just mentioned with respect to the fisheries agreement and is also an interesting framework, very interesting framework. So thank you for all of these very innovative uh, reflections uh, on this. It just shows uh, how dynamic the journey really is. So let me bring in uh, the representatives from Greenland uh, and, and Canada. And like in the other case, uh, ask you a kind of pointed question. It was interesting to hear the uh, list of uh, international engagement uh, that Greenland has conducted in recent years. But if you monitor the discussion about Greenland in the international media and elsewhere, there are, there are a lot of instances where uh, there is a case of uh, Asian powers in, on the basis of their economic strength 
playing a great role in the future uh, of Greenland. Uh, you showed a picture of the former Prime Minister of Korea visiting uh, Greenland. Uh, we are all familiar with uh, the discussion about the involvement of some Chinese companies and so on. So what is the prevailing view in Greenland uh, with respect to the cooperation between Greenland and the different countries in Asia? Uh, yeah, Jakob. Thank you. Very interesting uh, question. And I think I could say that in our point of view, everybody who are interested in contributing to a sustainable, healthful development in Greenland, in the Arctic region is welcome. And it has to be based on the principles, the rules of laws, and the development, the regulations that we set in Greenland and in the other parts of the of the Arctic region. I think there's no question about that. And then it doesn't matter for us if it's uh, from Asia, from North America or, or other places. I think it's very important that we keep in mind that for the instance of Greenland, uh, our population is represented in our parliament and in our government uh, who are taking the decisions, who are making the contributions to international corporations, uh, in that sense inviting the countries from Asia and from other places to, to be a part of this development because international cooperation is a key element here. We cannot do it alone. I think somebody said also it's not a local problem, it's a global problem. and with the discussions that has been earlier today and yesterday in relation to research, uh, with the plastic problems and so on, we need international cooperation. And then by some medias or some others are, are, are putting fear or putting militarization or, or other things in, in place uh, instead of the dialogue that we have. And that's why also we contribute to inviting Asian countries, inviting our international partners to Greenland to have a dialogue uh, on a firm basis. Thank you. And after the uh, next response, uh, I will ask the floor if there are uh, questions from the floor to, to the panel. But coming to Canada, I know it's probably unfair to put you on the spot, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Uh, if one looked at the prevailing uh, practices uh, of the Canadian government during the Canadian chairmanship of the Arctic Council, at least some of us observed that uh, uh, there were a lot of missed opportunities during the chairmanship of engaging internationally uh, with other countries uh, beyond the formal meetings, of, of course. And if you contrast that, for example, with the very active involvement of various U.S. representatives during the U.S. Rep uh, chairmanship, it was a stark, stark contrast. Then we had a new government in Canada and uh, many of us uh, giving what had been said before by the leadership of the party, uh, were expecting a, a big change in the international engagement on the Arctic on behalf of Canada. What we have seen, uh, whether it's a fair observation or not, uh, is that the preoccupation with formulating Arctic policy internally in Canada has now uh, taken up so much of the political attention of the government that various attempts in drawing the leadership of the government into this extensive Arctic dialogue uh, have not been successful and soon there are other in the next parliamentary elections uh, in Canada. And if I may say so, with due respect to the existing President of the United States, uh, it's even more important now and in, in the next few years, uh, given the North American involvement in the Arctic, that Canada uh, exercises 
uh, more active uh, role uh, in this respect. So can I ask you to explain to us why, uh, whether this, if you think this is a fair summary, uh, I know there are nuances and so on, and, and, and what can we expect, in your opinion, from Canada uh, in the next uh, uh, few years? Because otherwise, we kind of run the risk that the involvement of the new American administration is still a question mark. And to some extent, how far Canada wants to engage internationally in Arctic dialogue is also a question mark. That leaves two major Arctic states under a question mark uh, in the next few years. Increases the scope for the Asian countries, of course, to, to become more involved. Um, maybe I should start off by clearly saying that I don't have an answer as my answer. Um, with respect to where this policy is going in exactly the direction. It's true that it has been a long process, but I do think we also think it's a very important process to engage with the various stakeholders. I would also comment more generally, I guess, on our international cooperation. I know we talk a lot about, it seems like, about cooperation on Arctic issues strictly within the context of an Arctic platform. But we do a lot of cooperation on various issues that affect the Arctic but are not specific Arctic platforms. So for example, the work with the IMO and the Polar Code. When you look at our bilateral relationships, for example, we have strategic dialogues with Korea, with Japan, and with China, uh, with India. Um, our Prime Minister in his February joint statement had also referenced Arctic as an area. So it's definitely there. Um, your points are very well noted <laughs> about sometimes within the context of what is process versus what is actually a deliverable. Um, again, my caveat when I started off with this answer was I don't have an answer to your question. I'm hopeful, I think. Um, I think one of the clear things that, as you've pointed out since our chairmanship, is what I've seen in the narrative of when we're talking about international cooperation is looking at opportunities from a multilateral perspective and a bilateral perspective. And I don't think we're limiting ourselves in, in that respect in terms of looking at what serves Canadian interests, what serves the Arctic interests um, going forward. So let me open uh, to the floor. If there are questions, uh, yes, please. Uh, there are two here, one in the front, and then, yeah, okay, th those two, yes. Hello, Gant. Uh, let's hello, take hello. let's take two or three questions. Yes. Hello. I have a question to Mr. Piotr Rakowski. In your presentation, you mentioned that uh, one of the priorities of your country is inclusion of polar issues as a component of the national policies. Uh, um, it's very ambitious statement for me as a resident from the Arctic. And does it mean that? Uh, you could contribute to solving of very important Arctic issues such as lack of proper infrastructure, unemployment, high suicide rate, alcoholism, and many others. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mia Bennett. I'm from the University of Hong Kong. And I had a question for um, Ambassador Koenigs that perhaps um, Ambassador um, Gao Feng could also comment on, and it's regarding the EU-Asia connectivity strategy. So I think this strategy probably inevitably draws parallels with China's Belt and Road Initiative. So I'm wondering if the EU is positioning this strategy as complementary or perhaps a competitor to the um, Belt and Road Initiative. And also, have there been discussions yet regarding how the EU-Asia connectivity strategy would integrate the Arctic? Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we met yesterday. I'm Peter Harrison from Queen's University in Canada. And I'd like to take on, M Mr. President, your question about Canada, because an official of the government of Canada is in a difficult position. Uh, my personal view is that, yes, opportunities were lost uh, when Canada was the chair of the Arctic Council. And there are probably a variety of reasons for that. Um, but opportunities are often lost in, in, in this business. But your question about what is happening at the moment, 
with the new Arctic strategy of the government of Canada, uh, and I'm not involved in it. But I would say that the attempt is for the government to put its money where its mouth is, and that is reconciliation with indigenous peoples. The previous northern strategy of the government of Canada, the previous government, was top-down. And for a number of things, top-down works. I think what we're seeing is a very significant shift in philosophy, and that is, what is it that is of importance to the people who live there? And that takes a lot of time. And I would underline a very important distinction between Arctic states and non-Arctic states. Non-Arctic states do not have a population in the Arctic. Arctic states do. And therefore, there is very much not only an international dynamic, but a domestic one. And for a lot of uh, politicians, and I'm not one, uh, getting the domestic situation right is extremely important to be able to go on the international scene and to speak with credibility. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, okay, so let us uh, first, um, yeah, I think Peter. Uh, thank you, and um, to the question of the gentleman. Um, uh, yes, it's very ambitious. It's very challenging in a way that, uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, let's say the certain scientific and research footprint um, is a privilege and sometimes even a curse that we very much uh, concentrated on this comparing to the other activities. However, um, by the strategy and by the engagement um, both nationally with the national partners to go outside um, we would like, for instance, to make an interest with our industry. We have started already some programs like Go Arctic, which unfortunately was suspended, um, but hoping it will be continued. And, and for instance, our industry in small, smart housing, uh, we had a mission actually in Denmark and Greenland, uh, where our companies were uh, trying to, to see the opportunities to invest and to provide the materials with ma which might um, improve also the quality of life. Um, so um, it's it's um, it's still not very practical in a sense um, that we have a lot of evidence to show and to be proud of. But by the document and by the strategic concept, we would like to make certain processes processes to move on. Secondly, um, um, being still uh, in a way with a science, but not the natural sciences. Um, we have noticed for a couple of years already that our social sciences are developing very much in relation to the Arctic and what might be um, in a way profitable or, or positive um, from the perspective of the societies living there. For instance, recently we, with the support of my ministry, uh, there have been an, a conference um, organized, international conference um, on the social, societal relevance of the polar research we would like to um, to propose projects and to engage with the partners in the region uh, with different forms of um, conducting the research in the social sciences, which might result in a certain positive outcomes. However, I would like to highlight, we are, let's say, in the beginning of the road. Um, I know it might be challenging and, and difficult, uh, and it's very ambitious, but I don't think so that we should um, limit ourselves by the fact that there is a challenging and ambitious uh, goal ahead of us. Uh, it would be my also personal interest to, to promote this kind of activities, to go further um, within the area that you have highlighted, which are also very much um, connected with the uh, contemporary challenges and issues with the societies within the Arctic region. Thank you. And then the other question was to the European Union and China. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I don't want to defend Canada, but I just want to give one element of information that we have since a couple of years, the European Union has a uh, research alliance uh, on Arctic uh, research. 
together with US and Canada, and it's a program about 80 million uh, euros, and it's functioning incredibly well. So I can test testimony that there is a very active engagement of, 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 of Canada. Regarding the specific question uh, on the European Union and our new uh, um, strategy of connecting Europe with, with, uh, with Asia, it's not a response to the China's Belt and, and Road Initiative. It's not an addition. It's <coughs> Europe's uh, a set a st a strategy on connecting Asia with, with Europe and doing concrete proposals uh, 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 on it. Uh, it's also, uh, there are many countries that have a strategy on connectivity. I think Japan has one, Asian, uh, ASEAN uh, countries have one. So it's our uh, it's a strategy of dealing with it. It does not um, mention specifically the Arctic um, or the, the northern uh, sea route. Uh, this having said, uh, one important aspect of the connectivity strategy deals with digital connectivity. And here I want to mention, for example, there's a private initiative, uh, Finland, a Finnish company together with uh, uh, China, is planning a digital cable from Finland uh, to uh, China, uh, even already by 2021-2022. So I mean, it's, uh, it's not specifically our strategy, uh, focus on the Arctic, but I would say that it would it would uh, it would comprise it. Yes, uh, <coughs> I um, I think uh, 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 the policy of growth, uh, as included in our white paper, uh, everybody knows that, uh, used to be called uh, ice silk road, silk road on the ice, and there are. <laughs> and the other ver uh, ver uh, versions in uh, in uh, English, and it was used uh, many years already before the uh, white paper uh, uh, was uh, published. Um, actually, uh, as you may know, that the Belt and and uh, and Road Initiative did not include uh, the policy of growth uh, in its original version. Uh, as announced uh, by our president uh, five years ago. Uh, and it was uh, uh, based on, uh, on a, a Russian uh, proposal that uh, why uh, uh, you couldn't include a Northern Sea Route uh, as a complementary uh, route uh, for the Belt and Silk uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And then uh, we, our leaders, uh, uh, support this, supported this idea so that this concept was included uh, in uh, our white paper. So it, it was the history. I think uh, many people uh, knew, know it, uh, probably some don't. So this is not... Uh, uh, China's initiative in I its original uh, version. So it came from uh, Russia to include this uh, 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 policy of growth idea in our, in our policy. So that was the, the history. And now uh, I think uh, when this uh, concept was uh, uh, issued uh, uh, together with the white paper, and it uh, has uh, uh, been uh, uh, noticed immediately by uh, many countries. Uh, and uh, I think this is uh, uh, actually a, a great idea, in my, in my view, uh, as a special representative uh, for the Arctic affairs of, of China. Uh, we think that is a great idea, and uh, we uh, we are happy that uh, this is uh, in in line with uh, the strategy it just uh, 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 um, issued by the European Union. So it is not. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> there is a saying: "Great minds." <laughs> uh, how how to complete this uh, saying? Great minds uh, think alike. Yeah. I think that is the correct uh, way. I think that's a co uh, that's a, that's the how I understand uh, this uh, this uh, uh, situation. 
And really, uh, we are uh, in, a, in the same um, uh, we are in the same line of thinking, and we uh, I think uh, the what is behind is the reality of the whole world to wish for a, a better world. So that's the driving force actually behind the likely uh, thoughts, likely thinking uh, everywhere around the world. I think that is the, the real driving force behind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this. And uh, we are already uh, moving into the lunch break before we head out to the uh, uh, Polar Research Institute. But I think it is uh, only proper and fitting. We, I would give Park uh, the final word from the panel, please. So with respect to the form uh, operational the structure of Arctic Council, the, I think is uh, Arctic Circle itself is a good example uh, to complement complement uh, the role the in uh, enhancing our international cooperation uh, concerning the Arctic. So in that context, the, as one of co-hosts, I would like to express my deep appreciation, uh, gratitude uh, for the Arctic Circle Secretary. Once again, thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. And let me, uh, since this is the final uh, formal session before we head out uh, to the Polar Research Institute, thank all of you uh, who have spoken uh, both yesterday and today and for also to thank all of you who have participated in a number of other ways and, and made this uh, Arctic Circle Korea Forum, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, very successful in terms of substance as well as mapping out uh, the evolution of the Arctic and the relationship between uh, the Arctic as a territory and the Arctic states with uh, the leading powers of Asia and the international community uh, as a whole. When the Arctic Circle was established, uh, among the uh, purposes the structure was to give a platform and an opportunity for countries that were not uh, Arctic states as such to highlight uh, their policies, their vision, their contribution to the future uh, of the Arctic. We uh, initiated in the first assemblies what was called country sessions, where representatives uh, among other countries, uh, those three who are here in the panel and others, have come and then later Poland and others from Europe, Switzerland and others, explaining uh, their interests, their contributions, their science, their economic thinking, and their diplomatic positions with respect to the Arctic. And the thinking behind that uh, was that not only was the future of the Arctic uh, of great importance to the future of the planet, and we all know why, but also what happens in other countries, uh, especially in Asia, given its great population and the impact on the environment of the activities and the energy systems in Asian cities and elsewhere, what happens in Asia especially will have a great impact on the future of the Arctic. Uh, these are simply scientific statements of the interrelationship. And it is our task then to build a dynamic uh, structure of cooperation and dialogue to make sure that, as I've sometimes put it in a simple way, we, we don't mess this up. We don't mess up the future of the Arctic and uh, we don't mess up the future of the planet. Because if we make fundamental mistakes with respect to the future of the Arctic, uh, they will have grave consequences on the future of the planet. And similarly, if we make fundamental mistakes regarding the future of the planet, they will have uh, great consequences on the future uh, of the Arctic. It was not given when we mapped this out five years ago that we would be successful in making this dialogue uh, meaningful. 
that we would be able to draw together at the annual assemblies in Iceland and forums in other countries, representatives not only of these different countries, but also from science and business and environmental organizations and civil society. But what we have seen here in Korea, as we have seen at every forum and every assembly, this has become the reality of the dialogue and the discussion. And through that, it impacts on the policy making and the formal positions, not only of the Arctic Council, but also of countries and other formidable actors. But that would not be possible if there was not a, a committed gathering of people who are willing to make the effort and spend the time and contribute their thinking and their uh, position to making this successful. And that has been the spirit of each and every one of you who have come to the uh, forum in Korea, which I believe is the most international gathering uh, and diverse gathering of different stakeholders uh, in ever to come together in Asia on the future uh, of the Arctic. And as we close this formal session, I want to reiterate what I said in my speech at the opening. Our deep thanks to our Korean host, to the two ministries and the two institutions for their commitment and execution uh, uh, of this forum. And uh, it has been for us in the Arctic Circle, not only a pleasant experience, but also a learning experience and we want to thank you for all that you have contributed to the uh, growth of the Arctic Circle as an international platform for Arctic dialogue uh, and cooperation. And with these words, uh, I draw this to a close. Uh, we will have lunch outside, and then I believe the buses sometime after one o'clock will leave for the uh, Polar Research Institute. I have said in many places in the world when people are asking me <coughs> why uh, is Korea, and China, and Japan so interested in the Arctic, and my short answer has always been go and visit the Polar Research Institute. And then you see the scale and the level and the ambition of the commitment of these countries to the future of the Arctic. I don't know of any country among the Arctic states that have as high level, high tech, highly educated research institute on the Arctic in a single place as the Korean Institute that we will wish, visit this afternoon. It's a truly eye-opening experience. So I hope all of you will join us in that uh, second half of this day since the visit is also a formal part of the Arctic Circle Korea Forum. Thank you.